Yo, hello, hello, welcome to the elephant in the room. My name is Aaron and this is the last video of the book The Origin of Most Problems. So, the last video of the book The Origin of Most Problems. Let's first remember what we talked about in the last video. The Trump Superhero showed us the weight tool, the what am I trading question, which is very useful to detect the trades. But now he will show us the Vados tool, the exclamation mark, which even provides a more detailed way to um, check if a good or service um, is trade free or not, and also where it can be improved. We remember um, the Vader zone that I showed in the last video um, underneath the surface of the earth. Basically the better or healthier the Vader zone the better the outcome is. So the better crops we can grow, the better buildings we can build. And um, for our Vader's tool, now for the trade free um, yeah, kind of background, the VEDA stands for Volunteering Vitality, the A is for Automated Autonomy, the D is for Digitized Decentralization, O stands for Openly Operated, S is Self Sustainability and E is Educational Ethos. So these are our six degrees of um, healthiness, the six health checkpoints to see if something is trade based or not, the six rules if you wish to create trade free goods and services. Let's take them one by one and explain why they are crucial for our Vader's zone. So now our mission is to create a trade-free um, healthcare service for the people of the world, so like worldwide. And if we now apply the Vader's tool for our trade-free um, healthcare service, then the first thing we are checking is the B, the voluntary vitality. Um, because with that we are checking how many volunteers are working for our service. The more volunteers there are, the better, the more trade free it is. Because of course um, that means that people are not forced or coerced to work. Um, and that also means we don't have to pay them, so we don't have to make money um, in order to pay them. So we don't have to ask for trades from people. So yeah, the more volunteers there are, the better it is. And if there's an organization not relying on volunteers, but on paid workers, um, that's a red flag and we need to pay attention. Like if that organization provides this good or service trade free or not. And if they don't rely on volunteers, then it could be a red flag. So just we need to um, then investigate more. But you know, the Trump superhero is also saying that, of course, it may happen that an organization like this is not fully relying on either volunteers or paid workers. So it is a mix of both. This is why measuring every such health point in our scheme is not a matter of yes or no but a matter of degree. If our healthcare service relies with 80% on volunteers, then we can represent it as such and um, mark it here as blue. So 80% volunteers and 20% um, paid workers. Let's continue with automated autonomy. Of course, this one is about automation. The more and more things are automated in our service, the better it is. Because you know, if we rely on humans and volunteers, then maybe they can get sick or maybe they um, yeah just change their mind and don't want to volunteer anymore or maybe they are forced to work to make money somehow in this world so they don't have enough time anymore to volunteer so it's tricky but if we rely on uh, machines and robots and um, yeah just automate as much as possible then um, it is a good sign because of course machines can work 24 hours a day they don't need any holidays or so um, it's just better the trump superhero explains a machine does not have health problems experience emotional distress or require a break in terms of healthcare we would preferably need the medical checkups the research the distribution of medicine and the like to be as automated as possible so if you are doing research for a particular vaccine but rely on volunteers to do the experiments, research, interpret the results and so forth, then your likelihood of engaging in trades increases simply because you rely on humans or more thereof. 
But if these processes are um, more autonomous through automation, then you need less to know humans and your system is less likely to push you into trades. In other words, if you have an AI that can diagnose people as good as a general practitioner, then you can replace millions of human doctors with one single AI that will make the consultation process autonomous and automated and you as an organization will have far less worries to worry about one single AI versus millions of doctors that you may have to feed, take care of or hope that they'll show up to work. Therefore, if we analyze the state of volunteers for an organization, we should analyze the state of autonomy or automation. So in our case, after doing an inventory, we realize some 60% of its services are automated autonomous. So here we got 60% and 40% are not automated yet. The next thing from our Vados tool is the digitized decentralization. The more digitized and decentralized our service is, the better it is. Because if it's not decentralized, then there will be also this uh, increase of power. Because if it's centralized, then this power can push you to take advantage of that power. Like the Trump superhero explains, if this healthcare service relies mostly on volunteers and is more than 60% automated, we are on the right track. But if the system is centralized and uses paper, then the likelihood to ask for trades rises highly. What I mean is that any centralized system, due to its centralized nature, is prone to take control of whatever it is doing and in time, due to this power, can ask the population for stuff for data, money, attention, etc. And this is a red flag. To get rid of this potential danger, we have to first digitize our service as much as possible. A vaccine recipe that's digitized can be accessed and shared with everyone around the world. A clinical research that's digitized can be shared with any organization working on the same kind of research. Say you are in one part of the world and you go for medical checkups or you do them with the use of an AI but you also go for medical tests in that part of the world, say abdominal echography, lactose intolerance test and endoscopy. Now, if you move to another part of the world, if these records are digitized, they can be transferred from one institution to another and you can continue your health investigations from anywhere, unlike asking people or organizations to please print your data so you can take it with you and the like. That's inefficient and centralized. Digitization is the first step of decentralization. Your 20-year-old medical records should be digitized to be as easily available to be transferred to another part of the world or institution if needed. Think of billions of such records that are useful for both patients directly and for research. So you see, it just makes much more sense to have these things digitized because then you can access them from any part of the world. Um, and of course, like think about having these um, paper sheets where your medical data is um, on there. It's just, that's kind of, yeah, the past. And the Trump Superhero continues, you can have organizations that are digitized yet not decentralized. And in case of our healthcare system, of our trade-free healthcare service, we can um, say that it is maybe 95% digitized but 0% decentralized so we get something around 50%. So now the O is about openly operated because of course if it's a closed um, system, if nobody has access to it, then this will also kind of give the organization too much power and they can ask for trades for example. It's um, similar with the proprietary software, like Apple and Windows are um, proprietary companies that don't share the source code of their um, operating systems. So they can also like track um, the data of the users and that's what they do actually. But if it's open source and everybody has access to the source code and can see what's happening there, then um, of course you cannot inject any trackers or bad stuff if you will. The Trump superhero explains that even if our healthcare service relies entirely on volunteers, is automated and autonomous and digitized and decentralized but it keeps its records and the way it operates as a secret, 
then it will hold on to a tremendous power and will become prone to take advantage of this power at one point or another. This is similar to the issue of centralization and perhaps an effect of centralization. This is to make the point that decentralization can be a closed environment as well. So we have to add another health check layer to make sure that an organization is open. Imagine if this healthcare system is based on volunteers that operates worldwide. It relies on sophisticated machines that automate the process of discovery, treatments, medical visits, research and the like in a way so that they require less and less humans, volunteers. And now also imagine that they are very digitized and decentralized but they do not share their work. They have multiple organizations around the world similar to Doctors Without Borders Thus we can call them decentralized, but still their new vaccine recipe is not shared with the entire world. Even if they provide a trade-free healthcare service for the people of the world, the fact that they operate in a closed manner gives them too much power and hinders medical progress. Yes, they may offer that vaccine as trade-free for the people of the world, but keeping its recipe secret will give them in time so much power over others and we know where such great power leads to. Like only caring about themselves, their own profit, like in the case of Amazon, Google, Facebook and so on. In the future, because they held on to this power, they may say we only offer you this vaccine if you do this or that. Being decentralized, this may not happen since others from within the same organization will say no worries, we will give you this vaccine trade free, but it is a good idea to also check a project for their openness. In order to remove this danger, we must make sure this organization is openly operated. Its research, its practices, its mission and its technology that it uses must be open for all to see and use. So our own healthcare service, as mentioned above, is digitized and centralized. If it would be openly operated, then that would allow for decentralization, because like everybody has access to what this healthcare service provides and how it does that, so other people can also um, apply the same things in another area, for example. So let's say that our um, volunteer based, pretty automated and autonomous and digitized but centralized healthcare service is 90% openly operated. As you realize, although not decentralized, being openly operated will push this healthcare system into decentralization over time with others being able to copy their approach or system. I think it makes sense, right? Then the next thing is self-sustainability. So yeah, self-sustainability is about can this organization operate in the long run and that also depends on the previous checkpoints. Like if it relies on volunteers, then that's definitely more sustainable than relying on paid workers because of course then you need to pay them, so you need to get money. And um, what if the economy goes down and you don't have enough um, funds to pay these uh, workers, then that's not sustainable, right? Um, then also being automated and autonomous surely makes it also more sustainable. But we only scored 60% on that scale. Um, then also about being digitized and decentralized is also makes it more sustainable. So um, all these checkpoints, um, we need to consider them. And yeah, then there are some other basic questions about sustainability, like do they create waste, do they use renewable energies, do they recycle or do they dispose hazardous chemicals properly and so on. But that's a basic analysis of self-sustainability from a technological standpoint and not only. If our organization still relies on money, donations to pay for its facilities and research, then that is not sustainable in the long run since money is just a trade-based system that changes with time. Thus, it is unstable. A proper self-sustainable healthcare system would not rely on external support. It would self-operate mostly in an autonomous and automated manner and with the use of very few people having its operations open and decentralized. So what about our own? Let's suppose it still relies on finances from donors and only uses 70% renewable energies, but it does a great job at not impacting and destroying the environment. 
This will be a very arbitrary number since for each organization this health checkpoint in our Vados investigation must be thoughtfully checked. So let's say our healthcare system has a 70% self-sustainability rating overall. So 70% and we also can see that we can improve it here. And then the last thing is the educational ethos. Um, what is this you may ask? So basically this is about the educational motivation behind that service because think about we score like perfect on all those previous health checkpoints from our Vados tool but then we promote um, homeopathy or pseudoscience or so. Um, of course that also is fucked up then. <laughs> So um, that's what the educational ethos is about. Um, the more scientific something is, the more sane something is, saner something is, um, the better it is, just in general. And the Trump superhero also says that this last point engages a discussion upon this factor. Um, because yeah, people might be like, okay, it's, it's a little bit blurry, but I think you can say that the better scientific something is, the better it is. So yeah, let's suppose our um, trade-free healthcare service is like 100% scientific and no bullshit, no pseudoscience, no homeopathy and all that. So um, yeah, we score 100% on that um, checkpoint. Then there we have it, our worldwide healthcare system scores like this in those points. And the Trump superhero explains that what is important here is to understand that Vados is a set of instructions to check any service or good produced for trades. Because the higher it ranks on all of these six scales, the less likely it will be that this system is engaging in trades. Like think about, if a system ranks perfect on those scales, how can it trade anything when it's based on volunteers, automated, decentralized and digitized, openly operated and self-sustainable? It either needs nothing to run as a service or if it requires anything being open and decentralized, it's very likely that other similar services will pop up that will be trade free. Let me exemplify. So let's imagine an operating system that ranks high on all of the above scores. Let's call it trade-based operating system, TBOS or TBOS. TBOS relies on volunteers, its updating process and security checks and stuff of the sort are quite automated and it is of course digitized and quite decentralized with its copies being distributed around the world. TBOS is also openly operated so you can see the source code and even how they organize themselves. Maybe it is also self-sustainable, not even requiring donations for its maintenance and distribution. And their servers run on renewable energy. Its educational ethos seems to be neutral. We simply offer an operating system for the masses, they say. Although it is hard to see any reason why they would ask for any trades, considering the above, even if they ask for trades, like $4 per download of the operating system, or collection of data from users, the fact that it is decentralized and open will push others to naturally and eventually create a TBOS that is voided of trades. And TBOS, trade-based operating system, will become TFOS, trade-free operating system. The six health checkpoints are forcing an organization to become trade-free if they rank high on all the six scores. So there we got it, the trade-based operating system becomes a trade-free operating system. And now let's think about a human being that has pretty much access to everything what it needs and wants, like it has a house and food, it is free of debt, has um, a security, has enough leisure time and a scientific education. It is way less likely for this human being to become violent or like a criminal. The Trump superhero is saying criminals or violent people overall are those that are stressed out by the society they live in and or are lacking access to their needs and or wants. Therefore we can say for sure that a human who ranks high on those health checkpoints is less likely to become a criminal or violent. And that is true for our measuring system, Vados. It is a way of predicting. 
It cannot be perfect for sure, like some humans ranking high on those factors can also steal or become violent, but the degree of that happening is very low. Any good or service that ranks high on the Baylor scale is less likely to engage in trades. It either has no reasons to do so or it allows for other trade-free replacements of the same service or good to emerge. Let's see it in action in several other cases and keep in mind that the estimation is hard to do for the Trump superhero even though he's a superhero and at times his guesses are random but the important aspect here is to emphasize the method and not the result. So now the Trump superhero applies the Vados tool onto Facebook and if we go through Vados, if we check those um, health checkpoints, then we can figure out that Facebook scores pretty low on all of those. Like volunteering vitality, Facebook does not have volunteers, it pays humans to work for them. Thus Facebook is forced to make money, engage into trades to pay these creatures. If we check for the automated autonomy, then if we think about if all workers would like suddenly disappear overnight, then Facebook would probably continue um, for a while to just work as normally. If we think about digitized decentralization, then of course Facebook is digitized, but it is not decentralized. Is Facebook openly operated? Well, the Trump superhero says that some of their code is open source, but he assumes around like 20%. It definitely is a closed environment or service. Is Facebook self-sustainable? Well, <laughs> the Trump superhero says that Facebook is as self-sustainable as its richness and at this point it's a very rich company that will surely survive in this trade game for a while. However, being centralized, closed in its operations and dependent on paid workers makes it not self-sustainable. Let's assume like 50% just because Facebook is so rich. What's the educational ethos behind Facebook? Well, they say they want to connect the world, but in fact they are only caring about their business. Um, you know, there are so many scandals about Facebook. So <laughs> the Trump superhero would give it a slight 10%. So yeah, I mean, we can see a lot of red flags at Facebook. Um, the Trump superhero says, looking at Vados and not knowing that service or good we are talking about, we could clearly deduce that this is a trade-based service or good. So how does it compare with Mastodon, which is another social network? And I mean, if we apply Vados there, we can also figure out some red flags, but I think in general we can see that it is way better than Facebook. Like one of the red flags is in volunteering vitality. The Trump superhero is saying, although Mastodon seems to have been created out of a volunteer basis, they do provide certain trades in return for monetary support, such as access to their Discord to peek into their latest workflow, or they provide mentions on their website for bigger donations. The bigger the donation, the bigger the mention. He continues, although this does not prove that they do not rely on volunteers, it is a small red flag that showcases how they provide benefits to those who donate money to them. Maybe in the distant future they will offer early access to the newest code for the donors, making the entire Mastodon a little trade-based for normal users with them having to trade off the fact that they can't access the early code like those with more money who decided to support Mastodon. This is a slippery slope indeed. Regardless, in general, volunteers contribute to Mastodon. If we check for automated autonomy, then Mastodon will pretty much work same as like Facebook if all humans working for it would disappear overnight. If we think about digitized decentralization, then Mastodon scores 100% on that because of course it is digitized, but it is also decentralized, meaning anyone can um, take the source code and host Mastodon on the own server. So we don't have one central instance, like um, one central Facebook um, server, if you will, but we got multiple servers, multiple instances around the world, um, making it decentralized. It is also openly operated because um, the source code is open source, 
so everybody has access to it. Is it self-sustainable? Well, Mastodon relies on donations, but it perhaps relies way more on volunteers to keep its project afloat and thus it may rank somewhere around 80% on this chart. What about the educational ethos? They do not seem to push any agenda, they simply want a decentralized social network for all. So yeah, if we just compare it next to each other, then we can clearly see which one is um, trade-free and which one is trade-based. But also we can see that um, where are the weak points of the trade-free service, like where can it be improved? And that's the beautiful thing about the Vedas tool. So, and now in this example, the Trump superhero is applying Vedas to um, the organization Doctors Without Borders. And what do they do? They go to places and help people. That might be tricky to automate, but um, maybe you can come up with some kind of robots doing these tasks, the Trump superhero is saying. Um, but they are self-sustainable because they do rely on volunteers so much and not um, paid humans. Um, in terms of decentralization, although they have a few chapters that operate independently, they are still limited to a few that manage the rest of them, but it's still kind of great. And looking at Vedas, one way we could improve this organization is to make it more automated and autonomous with the use of technology like drones for delivering medicine or on-site robot doctors like AI systems that can quickly provide medical assistance to a lot more people at once and if possible to make the assistance remote and so forth. Plus, if it would not rely on money anymore, it would be a lot more self-sustainable. But of course, it's tricky in this world. And here are now um, a lot more examples where the Trump superhero applied the Vados tool. Um, he's also saying maybe some estimations could be wild. But um, yeah, you can just um, like play around and estimate if this is a trade-based service or not and um, you will see what the Trump superhero is thinking about those um, goods or services. And I'm not gonna do this now, I wanna, don't ruin it for you. You can just um, go on page 1092 and um, yeah, estimate or guess for yourself. And the Trump superhero is now talking to the kid again um, and he's saying now to combine the question mark with the um, exclamation mark you go out there into the world with these two tools on you. Go ahead, meet the world kid, test them. The kid is like, okay, let's do it. So the kid is talking to Framasoft. Framasoft is like, hi there, I offer you free software, video conference apps, document viewers, editors, file transfers, and so much more. The kid is like, wait, what am I trading? And Framasoft is like, nothing. The kid is like, let me check now. So it seems like you collect no data from me, you don't want my attention nor my money. That's awesome. I do see that some of your services are only in French. This makes it a bit tricky for me since I only know English. Framasoft is like, ah yes, we are from France and we are trying to include more languages for everyone to be able to take advantage of our services. We are sorry about this. And the kid is like, okay, hearing that, I don't see this as a trade. If you let others get involved and translate it into their own languages, and if you are saying that you do not have too many languages available because you lack resources, then I understand you. There doesn't seem to be a strange motivation behind it, like not wanting to offer your service to foreigners. Wait, what am I trading? No trade. And if the kid now applies the Vados tool to Framasoft, then what it figured out was that they almost rely entirely on volunteers, they are fully open and others can contribute to the project. And in that sense, that makes them decentralized as we are talking about software. They still rely on donations as it's the case with most projects in today's game of trade, but the donations are from multiple contributors. They do sell stuff or merchandise but it seems to me that they do not rely on that for funding. And their educational ethos is to provide free software for people, which is awesome. So yeah, that's how you can apply these tools in the real world. You can do that for any organization, any good or service that is out there. 
and the German superhero says, this is my way of confronting our enemy trade. I take with me these two tools to both detect the trades, the monster ghost, but also to help improve these goods or services or see exactly where they fail to be trade free. My shield and my sword. And the kid is now like, are you trade free, Trump superhero? <laughs> And the Trump Subir says, that's a very interesting question. As I said, when it comes to trades, I believe it's best to focus on goods and services and not projects. But let's think of him, Trump, as a service for people offering educational material for them. In that sense, he is providing trade-free services. He asks for nothing in return, no data, no currency, nothing. If we apply the Vados tool for the Tron project, then um, we can figure out that it looks something like this. Like Tron relies on volunteers only, but it is not as automated because humans are still writing those books, making those videos and so forth. But in terms of keeping Tromsai.com alive, the process is mostly automated. We are fully digitized and almost entirely decentralized in terms of our materials being available on multiple platforms everywhere from everyone. We are definitely fully openly operated and anyone has access to our stuff to share, edit and publish. In terms of sustainability, being underfunded makes us not that self-sustainable, but being so open and decentralized in regards to what we produce, our materials will never disappear and anyone can build upon them. Keep in mind though that we primarily care about trades. So say a piece of software is closed source but trade free, then that is a much better alternative than open source and not trade free. However, a piece of software that is trade free is likely to also be open source and in most cases it is a must in order to make sure it is trade free. Like of course because if you don't have access to the source code then there might be trackers in their program and you might not um, see that because it's proprietary. But the opposite may be not true because a FOSS, a free and open source software, can be free in terms of money or not, can also collect data or not, but has to be open source. That's their main rule. This recipe is not helpful for us. If anything, we would need TFOS, trade-free open source software. If a software that monitors people's hearts is FOSS, it can also cost money or data or other trades, even though it is open source. But if it is TFOS, like trade-free open source software, then we are sure that it is not a coercing piece of software. Also, if a particular organization offers trade-free food but has paid employees and is closely operated and centralized, then for us it should be okay since it is providing a trade-free service. Sure, it is not ideal and the VADOS in this case is on the red, but in essence we should mainly care about trades or non-trades, regardless of how they are managed or obtained. That should be our priority. The rest, the details, are just the details to make sure we push our society in the right direction and we have a healthy VADOS zone. So here again a software that is free and open source but displays ads into your face and collects your data is worse than a software that is closed source or not licensed but does not want anything from you. So like trade free. And also here again like a food service that offers food for very little money is worse than a company which offers trade free food. So the plan of the Trump superhero is to apply weight and Vados to bring to light the trades of our world and make sure that people know where the problems are with the trade free good or service or why a good or service is not trade free and how we can transform it into one. He's working tirelessly to push this kind of thinking and these services, ideas and technology. Because the digital world is one that we can do something about more easily and with less resources and it is a world that has everyday implications for anyone, as it's where people learn, communicate, collaborate and create, then he, the Trom superhero, is starting to build the Trom land. The digital land that has implications in every land. Visit it, enjoy it, share it, help it. So, 
the Trump superhero now says, let me turn the lights for my last words that I want to address to you. He is saying, let me remind you for the last time. This idea of getting rid of trade by making it obsolete is brilliant because it does not promote a fixed system or one that tells people how they should behave, what they should do and so forth. You cannot force a system upon people. You should not tell people that we need less violent games or competitive sports or that we should collaborate more and be more kind. These things never worked. Even the open source community does not deal generally with what the purpose of the open source software should be. An open source software that teaches you how to rape chickens is still open source. But due to its open nature, open source software grows collaborative communities that mostly create useful software. You see, it's that Vados thing. You create a good soil mixture and good and healthy plants grow from them. Same with creating trade-free goods and services. Yes, you could see a trade-free app that is pointless or damaging, but mostly you will see a spark of collaboration, openness and useful goods and services emerging from this Vedo zone, much like with the open source. How can we create a better healthcare system? Eliminate trades. How can we create better movies? Eliminate trades. How can we create better food? Eliminate trades. How can we create a better transportation? Eliminate trades. How can we create a better internet? Eliminate trades. How can we create better books? Eliminate trades. How can we create better software? Eliminate trades. And so on. And that's what Trom is trying to create. Trom is an antidote for trade like PureOS is for proprietary software. Look at how many Linux flavors are out there. And I mean, it's really crazy if you, <laughs> if you ever looked into that, um, there are so many different forms, uh, so many different forks, they are called. Um, Trump superhero is saying, they mutate, they evolve, they become something different, they die, others are born. As long as they keep the same aim at destroying the same enemy, they will eventually achieve that or continue endlessly with the same goal. Trom is somewhere in that infinite list, if there's such a list for combating trade, and that's where my place should be, the Trom superhero is saying. I am powerless alone, but strong together. People don't have to follow me, they can create their own Linux flavor, meaning Trom flavor, and spark new ideas in dealing with this enemy. He is saying, to all superheroes out there who are fighting trade, people and organizations die, ideas survive. The better the idea, the better the chances for it to survive. The more scientific and realistic the idea, the more chances for it to have a real impact in the world. You might be alone and misunderstood, hungry and afraid, but if you fight it, you are a superhero. The world may never know your name, nor should you seek for recognition, I'd say, but your little actions may spark the essence of seed creation inside the minds of those who listen. And so some may grow if the nutrients are right, and so they may spread if they become like you. Humanity is a long journey of many heads, and fixing our society will mean planting seeds in many of those brained heads. Trom superhero will die, but the idea behind it will survive. Through you, through them, through ages and regimes, if enough heads will carry it further. And to hope that the idea of me will cease to exist at the expense of a trade-free world can only make me smile and feel like my journey on this planet was worth the ride. And if I shall not get to feel a trade-free world, then others might and I'm alright. So we started this journey a long time ago, so let's see what we have learned. We understood. We understood that the world is just a game. Ownership, money, coins, documents, social statuses, they are all human inventions. This alone should empower us to realize that change is possible since it is a matter of neurons synchronizing with other neurons. We understood, therefore, that our society is like a monopoly game, imaginary and unfair. And no rule can change the nature of the game because it is the game itself that is the fault. We realized that the structure of this game at its core is trade. 
That's all it boils down to. We called it God, game of trade. And this God, this game of trade environment makes people behave badly. We understood in detail the game of trade and we realized that it comes in many flavors. Currencies or direct trades, data trade, influencer marketing, cryptocurrencies, social credits and so forth. There are so many that it has become like an infectious disease. We created the trade bubble, we understood its force. Now our enemy had a shape, a scant, a hiss. It was there, we could feel it. We accepted. We accepted that the closer someone is to the trade bubble, engaging in trades, the more crap, common, recurring and amplifying problems it will create. From organizations to space missions, from education to ideas, everything gets pulled when it gets closer to the trade bubble. Nothing escapes. We also accepted that promises made by those who get close to the trade bubble saying that they won't fuck things up are not holding true. They never walk. The force is too strong. We got ready. We got ready for the fight when we understood the act. Abusers, charlatans and thieves. Many, but we know them now. We got ready facing the two main creatures that emerge from the trade bubble, the statopus and the privatopus. With only a few tentacles, they control the world and they fought tribes and companies. Around 5 tribes and 175 companies control the entire world. From production to distribution, entertainment, food, computers, software, gadgets, clothes, medicine, nature, everything. We started to fight. We started to fight by understanding how not to fight. Laws and rules never solve problems. They will cripple and harm those who are harmless and have almost no impact on those that they want to impact. The bad students of the world like the mafia, terrorist, hacker, cheater and the like are bypassing any law out there because they are pushed by the same force of trade. No statopus or privatopus with their farts can stop them. We started to fight a common enemy and understood that the only way to fight is to focus on the enemy. One enemy, multiple solutions. Trump's plan is to equip people with a question mark and an exclamation mark. People have to detect the trades through them and create trade-free goods and services wherever possible. To both detect the enemy and make it obsolete. Our focus is on macro trades and Trump is just one set of solutions amongst hopefully a lot of others who will fight with us to push for the metamorphosis of our trade-based society into a trade-free society. The God creates the act and it creates the crap. We need to move from the God so no one acts like that. Wait for Vedas. So that was it. I mean, wow, what a book, right? It is, um, to me, it's always unbelievable to like, yeah, going through that book and reading it, understanding it, digesting it. And yeah, also applying it to the real world kind of, because of course it has implications if you understood what it's about. So yeah, that was the book, The Origin of Most Problems. I hope you found it interesting. Um, you know, you can access it. Just go on fromsidecom slash books. And um, yeah, also get into more details. Because of course, I made videos about it, but I skipped many parts. I skipped all the sources. You know that you can check every source that is in the book if you just click on it and read it by yourself. Um, so you can like investigate a bit more getting to know the book a bit more but it's just like I wanted to make videos about it and now I can uh, make videos about other topics about other things and um, yeah I'm just gonna say see you then in the next video I will continue making videos and hope you liked it as always I'm just gonna say take care and much love